Hi, this is Fizz30141 video 10. In this video I'm going to discuss the Hertzian dipole. So we saw in a previous video that the acceleration of a charge gives rise to radiation. Here we are going to describe the Hertzian dipole which is a very convenient prototype for very many real systems. And we construct um, the behavior of the Hertzian dipole in the following manner. We imagine two small spheres or two locations from which charge can move from one to the other. And we orient these two spheres along the z-axis and we suppose that charge is varying on each sphere. If we look at sphere number one, it varies with some time-dependent behavior. It goes up and down with some frequency omega as a function of time. And if the overall uh, pair of spheres is uncharged, we must have an equal and opposite charge on sphere two, which also oscillates in magnitude with some frequency omega. And because of this, we therefore know that there must be some current which is flowing between points one and two, which is the derivative of the rate of change of charge on either one of the spheres. Now we also suppose that these two spheres are not very far apart from each other and we can construct the magnetic vector potential. So remember on the left here we have this, um, this expression for the magnetic vector potential. It depends on the current density which we're going to take to be at the origin because the separation between the two spheres is small um, but we have a finite amount of current flowing and at some remote location r away from the origin, which is in the middle between these two spheres, we can, we can uh, obtain what the magnetic vector potential is. Now, in, this is the general expression on the left. And if we, uh, if we look closely, we think about which way the current is flowing and its time behavior, we can arrive at the fact that the magnetic vector potential only points in the z direction. Remember that the vector potential points in the direction of the currents and it has a magnitude I0L, which we can hold constant as L, the separation between the charge between these spheres becomes small. And we see that the vector potential, the strength of it, varies as 1 over R, as we would expect. Now remember that the magnetic field can be obtained by taking the curl of the vector potential, and we can uh, obtain it explicitly, and here we do it in spherical polar coordinates. We take this vector potential in the z-direction and we, de we decompose it into three components. A r, the radial component, a theta, and a phi. And knowing that the magnitude of a, the magnitude of this vector potential, is a over here, we can see, as we'll see in the following diagram, that we can decompose it into a r and a theta, where a phi, the vector potential pointing in the phi direction around this, um, this pair of, of spheres is zero. So let's look at that. So here it is again. So remember that the current is flowing up and down from charge one to charge two. As the current flows up, we already know that the magnetic field that we're generating is in the phi direction, B phi. So whatever vector potential we obtain, it must resolve so that we only have a magnetic field pointing in the phi direction. The vector potential itself points along the direction of the current flow. So this is the vector potential A, and we, we're decomposing it into a component AR, the radial component, and A theta, the component transverse to that. And we're doing that as a function of theta. So you can see this is where the sine theta and cos theta terms come from and we obtain the magnetic field from AR, which is A cos theta, A theta, which is minus A sine theta, and A phi, which is zero. We can obtain B as the curl of A in the spherical polar coordinates. And if we work through this, we find that the radial magnetic field, the magnetic field pointing along this direction, is zero. The magnetic field pointing transverse to that is zero, and the magnetic field pointing into the page, this is the azimuthal field, is the only non-zero uh, field, and it varies. Well, it has a 1 over r here that arises from the vector potential, but when we took the cross product, we see that there are two 
other terms, a kr term and a minus i term. So you can see that one of these terms depends on 1 over r, and the other term depends on 1 over r squared. So the 1 over r squared term is the Coulombic part. Well, this is not a Coulomb field, it's a magnetic field, so this is the um, Biosabit field. And the 1 over r term is the radiative part of the field. So let's look at that again one more time. <coughs> we have charge moving up and down, giving rise to a current, and this current is giving rise to a magnetic vector potential which is in the z direction. I can resolve that in spherical polars to give me um, three components, one of which is zero, the one which goes around this line of current, and from that vector potential I can obtain the magnetic field which only has a phi component. From that magnetic field, I can now obtain the electric field. So there are two ways to do this calculation. The first way is to arrive at the magnetic field and then to calculate the electric field. But in the next video, I will show that there is an equivalent picture where we obtain the electric field directly from, by considering the charges. But here, we take the azimuthal magnetic field and we obtain from it, by taking the curl of that, we obtain the electric field in the radial and theta directions. And of course this time, um, there is no phi in a phi term for the electric field because if there is an imbalance of the charges between locations one and two, there can be no electric field which points around that axis. There can only be an electric field in the r and theta directions. When I take the curl, I see another term appearing. So now I have in the electric field, I have a 1 over r squared term here and here. I have a 1 over r cubed term, which is this one and this one. And I also have a 1 over r term, which is this third term here. That is the radiative term. So these first two terms are to do with the uh, electric field um, around each of the charges, each of the spheres and I also have a dipole term, which is the 1 over r cubed term. Now, I'm not expecting you to be able to do this derivation. What I'm trying to show here is how we can show that an oscillating current gives rise to a magnetic field, and from that magnetic field, we can use Maxwell's equations to directly obtain the electric field. And this is a quite a complex set of expressions, so you should read through the notes to, uh, to see how this works in a bit more detail and to reflect on it. But the important thing is, is that an oscillating current gives rise to an oscillating magnetic field, which has two components, and two components of the electric field, which have some other components. So let's look at the situation where the distance from those two spheres is small. And this is the so-called near field situation. Near field is defined as being kr is much less than 1. In other words, I'm less than a wavelength away from the charges. And remember that k is related to the frequency omega in this way. And in that situation, if I look at those expressions from the previous page, they reduce to this form. So you can see that the magnetic field has a 1 over r squared dependence. That's basically because there's a current flowing as a function of time and near to that current there is a 1 over r squared strength of this azimuthal magnetic field and the electric field has a 1 over r cubed behavior and this looks like an electric dipole. So close to that oscillating current, close to those two spheres, the electric field looks like that of a dipole. Far away when kr is much greater than 1, what we're left over with, because the 1 over r squared and 1 over r cubed terms um, go to 0, what I'm left with is the 1 over r term. And of course, as we saw, anything which goes as 1 over r is our radiative field. And what we have done in this, um, in this set of expressions is we have directly calculated, using the magnetic vector potential, we have directly calculated the azimuthal field B, which is the only non-zero component at large distances. And if you look at the previous expression, if you look at the expressions 
for all distances, you can see that the only thing that's left over in these expressions when you're far away is this term i over r here, all the others go to zero. So we're only left with an e theta field. You can see that e theta is perpendicular to b phi. And when you look at those terms, you can see that the two fields are oscillating together. They oscillate together and they are in phase. And they are related in strength, if you look closely, that they are related in strength by the correct ratio that we saw would be true for a plane wave. So at long distances, these two fields look like a plane wave. And you should look closely at this minus i is saying something about the relationship between the phase of that wave and the phase of the oscillation of the current that is generating that wave. How do we obtain the emitted power? Well, we have directly calculated the azimuthal magnetic field and the polar electric field, and we simply um, combine them together to obtain the power. And as we would expect, the power uh, generated as a function of time oscillates because sometimes there is a current and sometimes there isn't. And we have a sine squared behavior as we would expect. And the important thing here is the power emitted is proportional to the separation between those two uh, chart, those two spheres, those two locations, and is proportional to omega all squared. So it's proportional to L squared, omega squared. So let's look again at this power that's emitted. So just to recap, here we are directly calculating the magnetic vector potential, the magnetic field, and the electric field for an oscillating current element. And if you read through the notes, you can go through step by step each of those particular points. I'm just summarizing them here. We are able to show that the power emitted as a function of time is determined by the amount of current that is flowing. This is obvious. It has a sine squared behavior, so we can do an averaging to work out what the average power is in, uh, that is emitted. And we show, we've shown that the power emitted is proportional to the separation of those two spheres squared and the frequency squared. So let's look at closer at that. We can see here that this is, what we're saying here is the power is proportional to I naught squared. Power is proportional to current squared. So clearly this term on the left must be something like a resistance. So this is not the resistance of what's happening to the current. This is a an effective resistance due to the fact that we have radiation. So this is called the radiation resistance. And you can see that the radiation resistance has a numerical value that depends upon the frequency with which we're driving current between those two spheres. Now you can see here that L is the separation between those spheres, and omega is the frequency with which the current is oscillating. So there must be a way of relating the wavelength of the radiation, which is given here, omega equals 2 pi c over lambda. So if we rewrite, we rewrite this radiation resistance in terms of the separation of those two spheres and the wavelength of light that is emitted, Remember that the light is emitted only at this frequency omega, or therefore with this wavelength lambda. We can show that, there is, that, there is, that the radiation resistance is determined by the ratio between the separation of those two spheres and the wavelength of the light that is emitted. And we can variously rewrite C and the, permittivity and, uh, permittivity, the permeability and permittivity of free space. We can variously rewrite the radiation resistance in one of these three ways. These are all basically the, th the same three equations where we have rewritten um, these constants. Now what's interesting here is you can see that mu naught c or 1 over epsilon naught c are not um, as fundamental as they might be. We can write down here mu naught c, which has units of impedance, mu okay, has units of ohms. Okay, you can see up here that it must do because power is related to current and this term here must have uh, units of ohms, we can write out the radiation resistance as 2 pi over 3 z naught L over lambda squared. You may wonder why we have this 2 pi over 3. This is a hangover from CGS units. But z0 is clearly some kind of resistance for radiation being emitted from our hertz dipole. 
Z0 is the impedance of free space. As you, it's a, a constant you may have heard of before. And it has a value of 377 ohms. Now, I should point out that in some textbooks, you will see it written down as an approximation. It turns out that 2 pi z naught over 3 is about 80 pi squared, so you sometimes see it written like that. That is not exact. And also because pi squared is around 10, you may also see it written down that the impedance of free space is something like 800. Okay, so, so be, be, uh, watch out for that. Okay, so the impede, our radiation resistance, so this should be radiation resistance here. I'll correct that in the, in, the, uh, in the notes. The radiation resistance is either 80 pi squared or 800 or 790 L over lambda squared. Okay, so that's a, a quick route through what a Hertzian dipole is. What we'll do is we'll illustrate that in the next video, next couple of videos, by talking about um, a half-wave antenna, which will make these ideas a little clearer.